Now I have to explain to you STBC. Space time block code. <clears throat> now here the thing, this was invented in a university, right? So it was invented by 1998 by Wahid Tarok. And I put the name because I met this guy. So Wahid Tarok, um, I think he was at Harvard at, um, basically when he did this. But anyway, I don't know where he is now. But anyway, 1998 by Wahid Tarok. Transmit multiple redundant copies from multiple antennas. So his idea was that if you have two antennas, then you don't send the same information on both antennas. You should send different things which are related but different. So let's say we have two antennas and I want to send two symbols, S1 and S2, two symbols. Symbols are some group of bits, maybe four bits is a symbol. Okay, and each symbol, when you code it, it has this, remember the 45 degree angle and other angles, so it has this horizontal part and the vertical part, we call it real and imaginary, right, so each symbol can be expressed as x plus i, y, i is the imaginary component, y is the imaginary component here, so comp so basically what he said was, and this is interesting, is that instead of S, you have S star, which is the complement of that S, which means X plus IY becomes X minus IY. Conjugate, of, sorry, conjugate of S1. Conjugate of, not complement, conjugate of S. Conjugate of S is that you, you just take, take the, you know, angle and reflect in the other direction, right? So, so if you have S1, so what you do is in two times, First time you send S1 from here and S minus S2 star from here, from the second, uh, from the antenna 1, you send S1 and the second antenna you send S2. The second time is slot. This is time and this is antenna, right? This is time and this is antenna. Then you send minus S2 star and S1 star. This is getting mathematical, but this is what the, those guys do. I mean, those who are in the coding, you know, in the communication department. They do this kind of math, right? But it's not very difficult to understand at least the concept. So now in two time slots, we send two symbols, not a big deal. Our rate has not gone up. If we had one antenna, I would have sent, you know, S1 in the first slot, S2 in the second slot. But now you have made the code stronger. So what is happening is this is a space, antenna is a space. And this is time, vertical axis is time. If you do this kind of coding, this is called space time block code. Now, when you when you, this guy receives this thing, it can fix several problems. It has received S1 and S2, and then minus S2 star and S1 star, it can do some mathematics and figure out what is wrong, what is right, where the errors are, where the corrections are. Okay, so we have made better use of the time and space by sending conjugates. Space-time black code. So space-time black code, um, this is rate 1, rate 1, this is called rate 1 because your output rate is same as your input rate. Basically, you are sending one symbol per, per slot, right? But there are other codings which are less and more. So there are many space, this was the beginning of the space-time black code. And recently, and recently, compared to 11, 11 was done in 97, and this is 98, and so obviously, you know, I mean, this thing was invented by a professor, and is now used everywhere. Now, one of the things that you will notice is that most of the things that we talk about here, once you talk about it, just everything that follows will generally use it, because these are good ideas. Okay? STBC is, is a good idea. And therefore, whether we talk about LTE, LTE advanced, or anything, anything that was developed after 1998 has to use it. Otherwise, they're not using the latest technology, right? So even though I'm talking here in 11, we will use it everywhere from now on. So the idea here is simply that if you have multiple antenna, rather than transmitting the same information, you transmit related information, okay? And that makes the reception much better. And so if you are sending X plus IY on one antenna, you should send X minus IY on the other antenna at some other time. 
All right. That way, if nothing else, you know X and Y clearly, and you know the phase much more correctly than if everybody's got X plus I Y, X plus I Y twice. Right? Because the phase is nothing but the ratio of the two. All right. So, so the idea was that if this is the space, the space is basically the antenna, antenna one, antenna two, and this vertical axis is the time. So this is slot one, time one, slot two. On antenna one, in time one you send S1, on the antenna two you send S2. Then in a slot two you send minus S2 star, which means conjugate of S2 and multiply minus. If S2 is X plus IY, what will you send here? If S2 is X plus IY, what will you send? Minus X plus IY. So here you send X plus I Y, here is a minus X plus I Y. You see, now you have two equations. You can clearly calculate X and Y, and you can clearly get the phase. Much better than if you have two X plus I Y. Similarly, in the second one, you do S much time. Now, so now you see what is the advantage of this. You, you don't gain anything in the rate. So this is a rate one coding. Rate one coding means you don't gain anything. Sometimes you can gain by this kind of method. Particularly, you are doing MIMO. You are doing two antennas. So this is rate one, but it reduces the error significantly. Now, it is not limited to two by two. You could have any m by n. You could have any number of time slots and any number of antennas. And we will not go into those details, but it's like MIMO, you know, you can have any number of antennas receiving and transmitting, and then there is a map behind it that says, you know, what you do, or how you make the best use of those antennas that you have. Similarly, you are given the time, and you are given the antenna, and you make the best use of it. Okay? So, so this is 2 by 2 STDC. So the next new idea, now, all of these ideas actually are pretty new. Because of, of course we didn't know about them before 11n, otherwise we would have used them in before 11n. So one idea is channel bonding. Now, channel bonding says that you don't have to use one channel, you can take two channels and bond them together. Means use both of them, which means that instead of 20 megahertz, you can use 40 megahertz if they're next feature. So if you if you do channel bonding, then you immediately use two channels next to each other, and um, then you get twice the bandwidth, and therefore your super goes up twice, and you can see better movies. So two adjacent channels, okay, so 52.4, now you can do some better optimization, for example, if each one of them is using 24, um, I mean, basically, it's a real thing. With 20 megahertz, we, we, they had the numbers before, where they said we use 48 for data and 4 for pilot. Right? With 40 megahertz, you can do 108 per, per, per data and 6 per pilot. You see? So you got lot, it is more better than factor of 2. Because they're next to each other and you don't, you know, have to do some of the pilots and so on and so forth. So you save some. And you don't have a guard factor yet. So, but, even though you are using 40, you will have to declare one band as one channel as primary because some stations cannot do this bonding. So transmitter say let's say can do bonding but the receiver cannot. Then you have to speak on one channel. Right? So everybody will tell what they can speak and then if you happen to find a station which does bonding and you are bonding, then you can use 40 megahertz. Okay, so you have to declare primary, and this is secondary. And another use of primary is this is where you send the beacon. And the primary you send the beacon, and you say, well, this this particular network has channel bonding, and it uses these two channels, these two things, right? And everybody who is listening can also say, well, I can use that. You know, when they when they send RDS, CPS, whatever. Third thing is frame aggregation. Now, frame aggregation comes at multiple layers. 
One is stream bursting, which is actually um, you send a PDU, you send a PDU, you send a PDU, multiple PDUs, and our frame fragmentation, which is just the opposite, you take a big SDU and big SDU and, 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 small, and make them into smaller SD, smaller um, fragments. You send RDS TTS and the fragment, RTS fragment, RDS CTS and fragment. Here what you are doing is you are sending your RTS CTS and then you are sending a bunch of them. One RDS CTS. Here then all this. And then there is a stream aggregation. Stream aggregation basically means opposite of fragmentation. You take tiny SDUs and put them into one and send. And this is particularly good if you're typing. If you're typing at one character at a time, um, we should generally send one character at a time because you expect an echo. If you don't, if you type something and you don't get an echo, you feel something is wrong and you start banging on the keyboard. So we cannot wait too long. But if you type two characters within few milliseconds, you're fast typist, then they will be sent together. Right? That is the last part. That is aggregation. Okay. In that case, what will happen is all these SDUs will be put inside a MAC PDU. This is one PDU. And then the last line says can combine any two or all of the above. So you could have this one PDU which is part of the same version, and this is right here, and there are multiple little SDUs in that one. And then the next one is a fragment, and next one is a fragment, and that becomes one SDU, and so on. So you could combine fragmentation, aggregation, and bursting together. So there are three different things. Yeah, in the bursting, basically it started with 11E. And in this RTS, you say, well, I want to transmit for 10 milliseconds. Right? And um, now you have 10 milliseconds and you can send 10 PDUs. Now, in 11N, you just want to explain the last thing, how it is done in 11N, same aggregation. So every, and this was, we already discussed question seven in quiz six, that every datagram becomes an MSDU. So what we do is we take every datagram, we put something behind it, something in front of it. And we call it a subframe. So we put one subframe. We take the second tiny datagram and we put the second subframe and, and so on and so forth. So that when the receiver receives it, why do we need subframes? Because when the receiver receives it, it can give to IP exactly as the IP has sent. Everything separate, right? That accounts. So we need to tell where, how long is this MSDU, where does it end, and so on and so forth. So, and the pattern generally is to make sure that the lengths are, you know, I mean, multiple of something. Okay multiple of four, multiple of eight, so that, you know, those things can be handled correctly. Okay? So you have a subframe header and a padding, an MSDU that is put here, and then so on and so forth, and then you have the whole thing, and then you have a MAC header and the FCS. Okay? And then you take these MPDUs, Right? You put them into this MPDU subframe, and that becomes, you can, take, you can take multiple of these and put them into the file layer, file header. So this whole thing, and it, this is like, I think like more like a frame bursting, where you have multiple of these MPDUs, and you don't have to have synchronization all over again. So you have something header, some headers in the front, and then five, five, and they're basically lots of maps. And then, and then um, this becomes PPDU, which is PLCT protocol data unit. PLCT SDU. AMPDU is aggregated MPDU. This is MPDU aggregated. So if you go back here. This would be what? Aggregated PPDU. 
I mean, yeah, basically, this is um, the physical layer, right? And um, yeah, so so this is how it is. And there are headers and trailers for every little thing there. And again, if you really don't read that the URL is in the bottom here, you won't get the complete thing. Okay, most courses have textbooks, and they, you go and read the textbook, right? Here you have to go back and read this. And I made sure that everywhere we have the references, and we have the clickable URLs. You just click this, and you will get it. No, 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 no. Anywhere, nothing is of the same length. Basically, they have to be multiple of something that's why you have to use, they're padding, but they don't have the same length. No, 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 you can mix a 1 millisecond and 9 millisecond, make 10 millisecond. Or you can make 4, 5 plus 5, 10 millisecond, any way you want to make it. That's not a requirement. Even when you do fragmentation, by design, the early fragments will not be the same size, the last fragment will be much smaller. Even if the first few are the same size. So now let us see the maxim. So we have already gone through the PDP, sorry, not PDP. I'm thinking of PDP 11. 802.11. 802.11 frame we saw before, and we went through the header frame control quite a bit in all these four addresses, right? But there's a change in 11N. In 11N, there is an additional header called high throughput control. Okay? And then only your data frame comes in. Now data comes in. The high throughput control has some new fields. And in particular, there's a link adaptation and so on and so forth. Now, I really don't, I mean, I could go into detail of each of these bits and bytes, but I don't remember it, and then you don't remember it. But what we do have to remember it is that there is a new frame control. Because this is where anything that is specific to 11N is there. And as we go into other standards, such 11ACA, 11AD, they have modified this particular field to their requirement. Right? So every protocol comes with a new header. And so I just wanted to introduce you that there is a new field which was not there before. Now, another, so the, 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 that is one thing, that there is a header, right? And the details, you know, again, are in, in that you are, you are like you before, but I wouldn't really ask you too much about it, except that you should know about the, this one. So I wouldn't ask you what is MFSI. Now, the second point is that first RTS is used instead of this. So if you remember the DFS diagram that we had, in the DFS diagram that we drew second time in the last class, somebody asked why we have this here, and there was three units of time. And um, that was the rule before that you have to wait for this. Now, here in 11N, you could just wait for one slot and send it. RTS, the request to send. And so anybody trying to use ABG will have less priority than 11N. 11N by design has higher priority. And now this is a cheating because, in some sense, because um, if you have one 11N device, that will clearly show better performance. The previous one now will become sicker, and then you will throw them away and buy a new one from Dell or whatever, and they're happy to do that. So, <laughs> so basically, the older equipment is phased out. 11 and do control. We already talked about that. So two two ideas. One is that um, for the first request to send, we use just a sys instead of this. That's all about 11n. And I think the reason I'm talking about 11n is mainly to bring up these new wireless developments, which are MIMO, STDC, free navigation, you know, and, and things like this. Right. And um, this is how the field is advancing and getting higher, and channel bonding. This is how we are getting higher and higher throughput. 